So I would like to read to you what I read to my Orthodox Jewish father from the 53rd chapter of Isaiah, written 800 or more years before Jesus came to earth. For he shot up right forth as a sapling and as a root out of dry ground, alluding to his miraculous birth. He'll have no form nor communists that we Jewish people should even look upon him, nor beauty that we should even delight in him. He is going to be despised and forsaken of men, a man of pain and acquainted with disease. This might surprise you, because in the Hebrew, this is actually a very good translation. And as one from whom men hide their face, he was despised, and we Jewish people esteemed him not. Surely our diseases he did bear, and our pains he carried. Whereas we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted, but he was actually wounded because of our transgressions. He was actually crushed because of our iniquities. The chastisement of our welfare was upon him, and with his stripes we were healed. All we like sheep went astray. We turned everyone to our own ways, and the Lord has made to light on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, though he humbled himself, and opened not his mouth as a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and as a sheep that before her shearers is dumb. Yea, he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and with his generation, who did reason? For he was cut off out of the land of the living, and here's the answer, for the transgressions of my people to whom the stroke was really due. And my father said, stop! You're reading about Jesus. So when anyone says to me that this is not Jesus, you can't say that to me anymore. Because if my Orthodox Jewish father who the last thing in the world wanted to believe was Jesus was the Messiah, says that Isaiah 53 was talking about Jesus, that's good enough for me. Amen. But then he said, stop, I don't want to hear anymore. And a few years later, he was dying in the hospital. And something happened to me that happened to me only once in my life. When I was a Jew lost in the New Age, an encounter with evil, not wanting to even live, wanting to die. I never wanted to die. I couldn't even think about death. But life got too hard for me. And everyone has their point. And I reached my point. And I said, I give up, but my Christian friends said, if you'll pray to God in the name of the Jewish Messiah, Jesus, he'll set you free. And I did. And when I woke up the next morning, I went to bed not wanting to live. Life was too hard. I don't know if any of you can relate to that. Life was just too hard for me. I reached my point. But when I woke up, my room was filled with the presence of the Shekinah glory of God, the same glory of God that rose Messiah Yeshua from the dead. And I knew, I had an internal knowing that Yeshua was the Messiah. That's the, then, I, then, a few years later, I felt the Shekinah glory again. For seven days and seven nights, I didn't know why, wherever I went, the presence of God was on me, in me, all around me. It was the most wonderful experience I ever had in my life. I've never been on drugs. I've never been an alcoholic. I can't compare what that is like, but I know that that's nothing compared to the Shekinah glory of the living God. And I didn't know why that was happening. And then I got the phone call from the hospital. Your father is dying. And when I went, I can tell you before God and man, 
I didn't say anything convincing to my father, but I carried the presence of God into the intensive care room. And when I walked in, my sister was there, who is a Jewish believer in the Messiah who lives in Israel now. Uh, and we said, Dad, Mom said heaven must be a wonderful place. She knew the Messiah. Would you like to know the Messiah too? My father had lost his voice. His whole body was dying and shutting down. But he said with an audible voice, yes. I tell you, the reason he said yes was not my persuasiveness. I tell you, the reason he said yes, because the Shekinah glory of the living God came upon him. So my last question of the night, two minutes, and you can say anything you want for the two minutes, not even answer my question. <laughs> Fair? <laughs> Rabbi Shmuley Botea, why does Isaiah 53 not speak of Jesus. First of all, that was a very moving story, and I hope that your father's memory is an eternal blessing and inspiration to you. It is. I actually uh, went to uh, uh, and said Kaddish uh, for the year at the Orthodox synagogue, and uh, even the rabbi's son made the statement that uh, I was a real mensch because of that, but go ahead. When I hear a story like that, what moves me, and I see tears in many of your eyes, is not that someone, a Jew, who hears a single chapter of Isaiah is suddenly drawn to a belief in Jesus. But for me, it's the story of a nation that held on to their belief in the God of Israel, who fought against the Romans, who suffered under the Nazis, who were kicked out and expelled from Spain who held on tenaciously to the faith of Abraham and the faith of Moses that is clear that no man is God and that every human being must lead a godly life and to be separated from that religion through a single reading of a passage without asking a single question? My God, you mean it's that easy? You mean my people didn't give this up? even when they were tortured and killed for it and a single reading of a passage, he was separated from the faith of his forefathers, from the faith of Abraham? When you ask me about Isaiah 53, and I just wrote Kosher Jesus because the Jewish community should reclaim a patriot who died for his people against the tyranny and the oppression of Rome. But when I read Isaiah 53, it can't be Jesus for the reason you just said. I'm surprised your father didn't catch it, Sid. Like a lamb to the slaughter, he opened not his mouth. Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's in Matthew and in Mark. My God. My God. Why have you forsaken me? He also says it is done. He opens his mouth. It also says, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days. Jesus had no seed, he had no children, and he died at about 33. I think this is speaking about Abraham Lincoln. I think it's speaking about Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King was the greatest American of the 20th century. Is there anyone who suffered the iniquity of the American people more than him? And he did see his seed. He suffered the racism of Americans and a white racist who put a bullet through his neck. Why isn't it Martin Luther? The point is, many people have suffered. But I want to tell you one thing. You can have all the most moving stories on earth about someone who embraces Jesus as a Jew through some epiphany and through some miraculous intervention. But you will never, ever hear that about me. It will never happen. I keep the religion of Jesus. It's called Judaism. We worship the one true, infinite, indivisible God. He is not three, he is one. I worship the one true God, and I am part of an eternal people who fought the oppression of so many others to stamp out our faith, and not a single moving story will end it, and not tears from an audience will end it. We will live as Jews. We will die as Jews. It is time for Mike Brown and for Sid to come back to their people. It's not just about having a coattail made of styrofoam Rabbi, in North Carolina. You're a minute it's, about, it's about the real real. It's three minutes, Rabbi. It's about a wall of tears that Jews 
and they've shed a lot, but not one would ever separate them from their people. It's time to come back to Judaism. It is time for my Christian brothers and sisters to learn about the religion of, of Jesus, Judaism, to enrich your Christian faith. I thank you for your friendship with the Jewish people. It is something that we appreciate. It is something that we glory in, and I hope that we will be much closer, deeper brothers, not through us becoming what you want us to be, but through Christians also respecting us for who we are. Thank you. And my father said, stop! You're reading about Jesus. Individually, any system. See, there are people looking for a way out. Christians are looking for a way out. Some find it in Hinduism. Some join the Hare Krishna movement. Some join the devil-worshipping cult. Look, you find somewhere along the line, the guy gets caught out, he becomes a Jehovah's Witness. He says he found it. He becomes a Seventh-day Adventist, he found it. Some become born again, he says he found it. The experience this is talking about is something subjective. In other words, human being, anybody, you're looking for a way out, his wife and him must have had quarrels, endless quarrels. Maybe he was imbibing too much alcohol. All these were problems there. He was looking for a way out and somebody came along with a little charisma and said, look my son, allow Christ to come into your life. I say it works. It does work. There's no doubt about that. But Hare Krishna movement also works. Islam also works. Buddhism also works. You are a drowning man clutching at straws somewhere along the line, some little help and you have saved yourself. But the question still remains. Look, you haven't answered the question. 40 years! Not a single Christian in the world of any church or denomination has come forward to say that the Holy Ghost gave my church this solution. The Anglicans, the Roman Catholics, the Presbyterians, the Lutherans come. As any church that says we heard the Holy Ghost came and told us how to solve the problem of surplus women, how to solve the problem of alcohol, how to solve the problem of racism. Look, these are individual experiences which everybody is going through at all times. I'm not doubting you, my son. What you said, I believe that your life could be changed, but this does not change 60 million Britishers. It won't change 250 million Americans. You need a way of life, direct instructions, which each and everybody can understand in a clear-cut language. And this book gives it to you. لقد كفر الذين قالوا إن الله هو المسيح ابن مريم وقال المسيح يا بني إسرائيل عبد الله ربي وربكم إنه من يشرك بالله فقد حرم الله عليه 